All right. Uh, thanks everyone for making it this early and very, very cold morning. Uh, I was thinking on the way over here, I was like, man, I'm so happy that it's not like fall and it's not like 110 degrees walking over here. And after like two minutes, I was like, man, maybe I shouldn't have wished so hard because it's <laughs> really, really cold. Uh, so just to make sure you're in the right room, I saw some people leaving earlier when I put this up, so they were not in the right room. Uh, so you should be here for CSE 340. If you're not, go leave. You know, we won't, uh, we won't laugh and make fun of you. Um, or you can just sit and maybe you'll want to take this class you know, after hearing what we have to say today. Um, cool. Okay, so today is kind of, uh, I'm going to tell you what the class is about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, hopefully try to get to know each other a little bit. And then we'll get into kind of some of the high level big questions that we want to answer with this class. Um, so let's go over, what's this, the, the story of thing? All right, so uh, basically have to go over the syllabus. So the reason why we go over the syllabus is so that you know what to expect in this class and I know, or you know at least what I expect of you in this class. Um, and if we have any questions, we can definitely talk about them now, get it all kind of out of the way and settled. Uh, can everybody read the screen? Yeah. yeah. By the way, this is a really sweet room. I'm really digging this room. <laughs> There's a lot of room with the chairs. Like you're all spread out. It's all fancy up here. Do you like the two screens or just one? Does it matter? It's fine for now. It's fine for now? All right. Let me know what you, what you think. OK, so a little bit about myself. For those of you that don't know me, I see a few familiar faces, so that's good. Um, so I'm Adam Dupe. Uh, you can call me Dr. Dupe, you can call me Professor Dupe, you can also just call me Adam, which I prefer, that is totally fine, whatever you want. Uh, a little bit of background about myself, I did, let's see, I did a total of nine years at UC Santa Barbara. So I did my undergrad there, did their four plus one program, so got an undergrad and a master's there. Uh, then decided I hated, well, maybe that's too strong a word. Uh, I wanted to, was done with academia, wanted to go work, and I, so I went, uh, worked full time at Microsoft for a year as a software developer uh, up in the Seattle area. And then I was like, well, man, maybe I really do like doing research. Um, so I went back to Santa Barbara for my PhD, where I worked on, uh, my area of specialty is security research, so specifically how to automatically find vulnerabilities in uh, software. And so I did that for four years, and then after that, I was fortunate enough to be here. So this is my third semester here at ASU, so I'm pretty excited. And there's half the number of students here that I taught last semester for 340, so I'm also very excited about that. Um, yeah, any questions? Was that a hand or no? Just a high scratching. Got it. OK, any questions about me, my background, anything? Uh, my office is here. I'll be uh, meeting with the TAs today to establish some office hours. We'll try to keep them spread out throughout the week so that all of you can get help on the course. Um, it is really important to take advantage of that. I know sometimes it can be a little weird. You maybe don't want to, I don't know, maybe you're intimidated. I hope I'm not too scary. Maybe like just scary enough. But, uh, no, I, you know, please come and see us. Come see the TA. Uh, we want to talk to you, we want to help you. Is the TA here? Yeah, you want to stand up and introduce yourself to the class? Hi, my name is Ankur and I'm a PhD student and my area of specialization is uh, network security. Cool. All right. So yeah, we'll be posting all of our info, all of that stuff uh, in here. OK, so unlike other classes, I guess I'll get down to it in a bit, but unlike other I absolutely hate using Blackboard. Every time I have to use Blackboard, it makes me feel like the stupidest person that's ever lived. And maybe you've never seen the other side of it where you have to like create things. It's just like a nightmare. It's the, it's the most enterprise-y software I think I've ever been used. Uh, so we will use Blackboards for me to post the homework, the homework assignments to you, and for you to submit the homework assignments, because that's a lot easier for us to grade that stuff. Uh, we'll also post grades on there, but pretty much everything else will be happen on this course mailing list. So all class announcements, any questions you want to have asked, can we go through <coughs> the, the mailing list? Questions so far? Lots of material. I know. It's a lot. Okay. Uh, office hours. So yeah, please. So, you know, we will... Uh, can you read 
read that in the back? I'm going to say no. Did you read that? What's the second paragraph, third word say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll make it bigger just in case. Okay. All right, so uh, the point of the office hours are that you can come ask questions. So this is going to be a very programming intensive course. Uh, so much so that it's probably much more programming than you've done in your previous classes. And this is specifically by design, because as a computer scientist, you need to be able to build complex systems and be able to take something from specification and build uh, something pretty much exactly the way we want it. Um, and so because of that, so anybody here code perfectly? Yes? <laughs> okay, I would venture that maybe you're not coding hard enough or solving ambitious problems, right? It's easy to code something simple perfectly, right? And even then sometimes it's difficult. Uh, one of the tricky things, especially at your stage, right, is it's very hard to estimate how long something's going to take because maybe you think everything's going great and then you hit a bug that takes you four or five hours to find and fix, right? And you never know when exactly those things are going to come. So. To survive in this class, you've got to start early on the programming assignments, and when you have problems, you've got to ask the mailing list or come into office hours. <coughs> so I really urge you to take advantage of that. Uh, one thing we will not do is you come in, give us your program, and be like, my code doesn't work. <laughs> well, that sucks. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? Um, I'm not going to spoon feed you the answers, right? It's my job to help you think about and understand what's wrong and try to figure it out what's wrong about your code rather than me just say, oh yeah, you didn't uh, free that buffer over here, and now it's being reused, and now that's where that second page of fault's coming from. So, uh, you know, when you ask questions, I have a link here, which I think is a really good uh, uh, essay. It's how to ask questions the smart way. So if you've never seen this before, it's all about if you just say, hey, what's the answer to problem three on the mailing list? Right? I'll probably say, mm, you know, maybe you should think about it. Uh, if you have we're much more like, you're much more likely to get a response and help if you say, hey, I'm stuck on problem three. I've tried you know, X, Y, and Z, and I see that the grammar looks like this, and I see that the third production rule looks like this, but I still, the answer that I'm getting doesn't make sense because of X, Y, and Z. And I Googled and I looked at this page, and this page says this thing, but I don't really understand it, right? So if you demonstrate that you've put in some effort to solving your problem when you come to us, absolutely happy to help, right? We want to help you. We want you to be successful in this class. Uh, so yeah, this is a really good um, uh, essay about how to ask questions. And it helps in all kinds of things, so uh, class stuff, Stack Overflow, all that kind of stuff. Okay, questions on office hours? How many of you have been to office hours in a class? Okay. Has anybody not? Okay, come to my office hours. <laughs> So just to be very, very, very clear, all announcements and communications about this course is going to take place through the mailing list, So, which is the wrong link there. But <laughs> actually, I think it's the right link. It's the wrong text. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just a Google group. Uh, I highly recommend you sign it up to, there's like settings when you sign up for it, have it send you emails automatically. That's the best way to keep up to date on the course because oftentimes one of your classmates will ask a question that maybe is something that you're struggling with. And so when I respond, right, rather than you later say, oh, I'm also having the same problem, you'll probably just get a link to the discussion on the forum, right, because you've already answered that question. Okay, and I, the other great thing, what I really like about this mailing list is uh, we're only two people, right, and you are, anybody know? More than two. More than two. That is also correct. If it was four, it wouldn't be a big problem. What's that number on the back there? 125, right? You're 125 people. So we want you to succeed. We're going to help you. We're going to do everything in our power. But really, part of the way to survive this course is to help each other in the class, right? So if somebody posts a question on the mailing list and you think you know or maybe know an answer, you're totally more than welcome to uh, reply. And I actually really encourage you to do that. Now, just like I said, right, if we don't want to just spoon feed people the answers, right? Oh, problem three, that's, you know, five. It's probably not going to be as simple as five. <laughs> um, 
but you can help answer or clarify things or questions about concepts or how does this grammar work if there's an epsilon here or how do character star star pointers work when you dereference them and uh, take the address of operator, all that kind of stuff. So uh, don't go overboard. Don't send any other student like your code or anything like that. Don't post that on the mailing list. That's also very bad. Um, it's a lot better. I also like it if you know of a resource right, that can help them. Send them the link to the resource right, so they can further their understanding and be able to learn and kind of understand it rather than giving them the answer. Um, yeah, so the other thing is, so also with 125 students, right, um, the communication gap or the communication difference here. So if you have a question, it's a lot easier if you post it to the mailing list. That way I can get to it, that way the TA can get to it, or that way one of you can get to it, right? If you just send it to me, I get a lot of emails, I'll just say that, right? So it may take me a little while to get to them. I'll definitely reply to all of them. Um, and then if I think it's uh, helpful, and oftentimes I will when you email me directly, if it's something I think the whole class can benefit from the response, I'll CC the class mailing list so that everybody can see that response. Uh, obviously not if there's private information there. Um, if it's borderline, I'll ask you. The default is to not, but uh, but oftentimes I will because I think it makes it a lot easier for you and I think it's very helpful for everyone in the class. Questions, mailing list, all that kind of stuff. All right, prereqs. You've been able to register this for this course, so you probably, this probably is not necessary. All right, textbooks. Uh, so this is the recommended uh, textbook. It's not required. You don't have to have it. it. I'll say it's good on some parts. It's not great on other parts. But it can serve as a pretty good uh, additional place to try to understand some of the concepts and some of the techniques that we're talking about. <coughs> um, you can definitely also get the second edition, which is a lot cheaper. So you know, do with that what you will. I'll post. So for each of the topics that we discuss, I'll post the relevant material in the book for both the third edition and the second edition. Um, so that, that way you can use whichever one. Okay. Uh, lecture topics, I don't think nobody really cares about that, except for big old things. Uh, the exam dates will be posted in advance. We'll be posting them soon. Uh, I guess the other thing that I didn't mention so far about this class, right? So there's another section of 340 this semester. You should be aware there was a choice. You chose the 9 a.m. one, so it's kind of on you. Um, so we're going to try and sync up project due dates and exam dates so that we're more or less aligned. So that's why I will post them very soon, the exam dates, but we've got to, me and Professor Bozzi have to talk and find out a good date. Um, so you basically have to let me know in advance if you're going to have to miss, uh, if you have to miss an exam, please it needs to be a real reason, right? Um, religious holidays, university-sanctioned activities. Let me know in advance so I can do something different for you. Um, if it's due to medical reasons, they need to be documented. Because there's a lot of students. So. 340? No? I guess not. <laughs> OK. Workload. How many courses have a workload section? Not a lot. OK. It's, this is a demanding class. This class requires <coughs> consistent effort. So I'm going to tell you this now. I probably will not in the future go, I told you so, because that's not the kind of person I am. But uh, if I give you three, four weeks on a project, when should you start that project? Three or four weeks before the due date. Yes, right? <laughs> as soon as it's assigned. And we'll get more of this as we get closer to the projects. but. Uh, I saw some things last semester where people didn't start until three days before the assignment was due. And I give you this amount of time because these are difficult, complex assignments that you have to build, essentially, some of them from the ground up. So you have to decide how to design it, how to code it, how to make it execute on our test cases, what kind of algorithm do you, you even need to come up with the algorithm to be able to solve it and apply it to this problem. So. Uh, these are things that even if you're not coding right away, you need to be thinking about this problem. How am I going to solve it? How can I create an algorithm to solve this? And if you don't do that, if you wait till the week of, you're just going to get hosed. And I don't give extensions. So don't definitely do not count on that. Um, 
you're going to have to write a lot of code. You're going to have to read and understand code that we give you. So we may say, hey, use this lexer and use that to create a parser for this language. And so you've got to understand our, our code to understand how it works and how to use it in your, um, in your, uh, your program. Um, so why do we do this? Is it because I'm very mean? You can say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to be mean. I'm Honest. Just and fair or something like that. Um, no, so this is, this is real life, right? So the closer you're getting to graduation, the more and more we ramp up. Hey, you have to be able to solve difficult problems. You have to be able to design software. You have to be able to um, read code, right? So these are things you have to do in the real world, right? Actually, it really surprised me when I was at Microsoft, right? Because you, you go through your undergrad career and you're like creating all this stuff and you like software and you think it's really cool. And you get to a company, are you creating stuff from scratch? Probably not. Probably not, right? Yeah, you're probably, they're like, hey, great, you're working on this project. Oh, by the way, it's like 200,000, 500,000 lines of code, whatever it may be, right? And now here's a bug, go change that thing. And you're just like, uh, <laughs> right? So this is part of the skills that you're developing, obviously not in that massive of a context, but these are the skills that you have to have in order to be a successful computer scientist, software developer, software engineer. And so yes, it's gonna be a very demanding class. You will work a ton in this class, but I think that it's very much worth the effort and it's gonna make you a better computer scientist and a better programmer. And so not only that, so if it was just a programming class, that would be difficult, but we're also going to discuss theoretical concepts, new ways of thinking about programming and programming languages, uh, new types of theory and abstract concepts, and so you're gonna have to also understand that, which is part of why I really like this class. Questions on workload stuff? So if you're having mm, some doubts about the class or ah, I've got a whole bunch of stuff on my plate, uh, it's worthwhile to seriously consider this part and maybe I don't know, consider taking this class another semester when you're not as full. All right, assessment. Okay, so mm, homework. Uh, there'll probably be five homework assignments, four homework assignments. Uh, the goal of the homework assignments is really just midterm prep. <coughs> so the idea is we're give you questions based on some of the problems that we've been talking about in class. You'll go through them, you'll submit them, we'll give you feedback so that, that way, when you see those questions on the midterm, you're not, oh my god, oh, we've never talked about first and follow set. Actually, we spent a week on that and you did a homework assignment on that. Um, there'll be three midterm exams sprinkled periodically throughout the course. Um, these will be helping to reinforce the concepts in class, all that kind of stuff, make sure the homework's. Um, programming projects, there's gonna be five projects. The first two are pretty easy, as we'll see. Uh, the last three are the very, very, very difficult ones. Okay, and one final exam that's comprehensive and covers everything in the class. Questions? All right, grading percentages, uh, let's see. Homework 15, midterm exam is 30, so each midterm is 10. Uh, programming project is 40. Let's see if the math is right here. Yeah, it is. So projects one and two are each 5%, and projects three, four, and five are 10%. Uh, then 15% for the final exam. Questions? So the programming projects are a ton of work, so that's why they're rated very highly. But they're good, because they help reinforce the things we're doing in class, and the things we're doing in class help reinforce the programming projects. All right, so these are what I, I, so what I'm doing right here is promising you that these are the thresholds for the grades. So if you get a 97 or above, you get an A+. Plus. So I may, what I say here is I may reserve the right to curve the grade down by lowering, but I'm not going to curve them up. So if you get 97% in this class, you'll get an A plus regardless. Um, so I'd love everyone to hit this 93. Right? If, if you all get do 93% on the projects, or on, on the projects, on the course, I will give everyone in this class an A. 
absolutely promise. So no curving like that or none, none of that nonsense. Um, so I'm still optimistic that will happen. So. <laughs> Has it not happened yet? Uh, no comments. <laughs> I guess I should say I can't discuss students' grades uh, legally. <laughs> Yeah, so I may pull these down, but I won't ever pull them up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you'll be able to know at any point in time, right? So another thing, right? So this is just a formula. It's a mathematical formula, right? So you can at any point in the class plug in the grades that you got on the assignments to come up with what's your current grade, right? Cool. And then you can use this to find out the letter grade. All right. Questions? Grading? Grades? Letter grades? Okay, this is something that's very important because I think some people maybe don't believe me. Okay, so written homeworks. Homeworks are all written homeworks. Uh, they must be submitted online on Blackboard by midnight on the date that they're due. No late homework. And I'm talking 12.05, 12.06 is too late, zero on the homework. So submit online. You can submit multiple times on Blackboard, so please if you're still working on it, submit something. That way we have something to grade. Um, you know, this is also inspired by the real world, right? Like your, your boss asks for something, it's because he, he or she needs that thing before a meeting, and if you don't give them that bug report or the list of outstanding bugs or the, I don't know, the current, your current sprint status or something like that, right? Then they can't do their job, and so you know, it's important that you're able to hit and know the deadline. This way, there's no ambiguity, right? Everybody knows it's due by this date, this time. That's it. OK. Project due dates, projects are a little bit more difficult. So uh, for each day that a project is late, 20% deduction uh, based off of the grades that you got on there. So on almost all programming assignments, they'll be automatically graded. So you'll be able to, through a submission system, submit your code and get feedback on exactly how many test cases you passed. And from there, you can figure out your grade very, very simply. Yeah. Are we allowed to submit multiple times? Yes. Or? You can submit as many times as you want. And obviously, I don't know, maybe I should, well, no, I should just say it just sort of being clear. Uh, obviously, no messing with or, I don't know, trying to figure out the test cases by stealing code or running some malicious code on the server, right? <laughs> like you're honest, ethical people, so don't do that. Um, we will have serious, serious problems. Uh, if you have a documented med medical emergency, uh, you know, talk to me and we'll come to something that's fair. Um, so, you know, like I'm saying, right, if you have a four-week assignment and you're sick for two days, mm, mm, I don't know, right, probably not, not an extension, not extension worthy because there's a ton of time to work on these projects. Um, but talk to me, I'm reasonable. But it's not just, when you, we gotta remember when you talk to me about these things, right? It's not just you I have to think about. I think about what's also fair to the rest of the students, right? So um, that's just what I have to do. Questions on this? All right. Okay, so I did this last semester. I think it was helpful. Uh, so I'm gonna try to record all class lectures and post them on YouTube. Um, and I'll post the link to those on the course website. Um, but, so this is a best effort kind of thing, so if it turns out that I forget this microphone and the recording's really crappy, or I lose my laptop, or I don't know, something could happen, right, I'm not going to re-record a lecture just to post it online. Um, so it's not guaranteed, don't count on it, because um, you're still responsible for the material that's covered in class, but I will do my best to try to do that. I've heard the feedback from the students last semester was that it was very helpful when prepping for exams or they had to miss class or something like that. So um, I think it was useful and it's very little work on my part. So I will keep keep doing that. And I don't like cut it or do any cool like fades or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Although that would be kind of cool. If somebody wants to do that. All right. Cell phones. Cell phones vibrate. Uh, if you have any special accommodations, talk to me. Right. We can make that work. All right. Okay. This is an incredibly important section, so I'd really like everyone's full attention on this. Okay, 
incredibly serious issue, plagiarism and cheating. So what constitutes plagiarism or cheating? Okay. Yeah. Taking somebody else's work and claiming it as your own. Yeah, taking somebody else's work and claiming it <coughs> as your own. Excuse me. In programming assignments or the projects that you're going to be doing, what kind of stuff would that entail? Taking someone's code. Taking someone's code. Yeah. Pulling a solution off Stack Overflow or something? Uh, say that again? Pulling a solution off the Stack Overflow or something like that? So pulling a solution off Stack Overflow. So, so probably they wouldn't have complex enough. Right. Yeah, so never mind. Yeah, so actually that, that's something we'll talk about in a, in a second. So if you do find <coughs> code on Stack Overflow, and it's for a specific thing, how to, I don't know, iterate, reverse over a doubly linked list or something like that, um, the license on Stack Overflow says it's Creative Commons, so you can use it. Uh, I'm fine if you use it, but you better put a comment in your code about where that code came from, right? Because if uh, one student uses some code from Stack Overflow and another student uses code from Stack Overflow, but neither document that, and so we say, hmm, this code looks identical, <laughs> right? Then now we have a problem, because how do we know you got it through Stack Overflow and not through each other? So that's the big issue. If you want to use that, I'm, so realism, right, realistic. I use Stack Overflow, Google when I'm coding constantly. <laughs> uh, mainly I'd say mostly because I, I don't know, I'm using a lot of programming languages so I never know, like, okay, how do I do this stupid thing in Python or in C or something like that. Uh, but I use it all the time, so I'm not gonna prevent you from using it because I think that's silly, but also don't, don't say on Stack Overflow, how do I use Alexer to parse tokens in a thing, right? That's like a programming assignment. <laughs> what other things would constitute? We've talked about some things. What other things would constitute? Working on a project together with someone? Yeah, working on a project together with someone. So, you know, these assignments, these, pro uh, these projects are individual projects. Uh, and I will admit that that, you know, uh, takes away from the realism in some aspects, right? Because Rarely ever are you going to be solo developing a whole entire project you know, by yourself, right? You have to work with other people. Uh, but at this stage in your development, right, being able to hone and develop those skills of how to organize, how to design a complex system is incredibly important. So I really do want you to work on those problems, uh, work on the programming project <coughs> alone. So yeah, if Let's say, I don't know, you and a friend are working in the lab really close to each other. You never look at the code, but uh, the code comes out exactly the same. So we're going to have problems. So don't do that. You can talk at a high level, right? So I think at a high level is fine. Like, oh, <coughs> you know, oh, how'd you do that thing? Like, oh, yeah, you iterate over this thing. If you talk about it at a high level, it's less of a problem. Uh, if you're talking about it at a low level and your code comes out the same, then that's very bad. What else? Yeah. Sending your code to someone? Yeah, that was a big one, right? So we talked about taking code from someone, but sending code to somebody, right? So yeah, you're just <laughs> as culpable. And in fact, in my mind, uh, it's almost worse in some sense because the person who, caught, who plagiarizes is probably very desperate. That's what I've seen is they're, ah, it's right before the deadline. Just ah, let me, please give me your code, right? But then they, they don't learn anything, right? They didn't go through that development phase of, oh, let me fix all the problems, and oh, and they didn't solve all those problems that came up. They didn't design the software, right? So you're really taking away from, uh, from their growth and their experience as a computer scientist. So I would much rather you take a zero on the assignment and the project than plagiarize. Um, okay, so. All right, so this is the big thing. So zero tolerance, I have an absolutely zero tolerance policy in this class. So I've only been here three semesters. I've only taught two classes, I guess, so far. Um, I've already issued 20 academic integrity policy violations. Um, and how many grad students in this class? Deficiencies, some? Okay, okay, hopefully I won't have to worry about you. Um, <laughs> Okay, then this doesn't apply, but some of these were grad students, so I treat grad students, undergrads exactly the same. Um, so I, I do not want this number to increase because I hate being the bad guy, uh, but I will do it because it's fair to everyone else in the class, right? So, um, you know, you 
I have to think about all the fellow students who put in the work and tried really hard and maybe got that zero or got, I don't know, 10 or 20 percent, right? But they tried really hard and didn't cheat. And then you have the students who cheated, plagiarized, and then, um, you know, that's not fair to those other students. So I will, uh, when we detect it, and we're very good at detecting it, um, it'll be, you'll get a zero on the, pro on the assignment, uh, a, lower, a lowered letter grade in the course, and the violations reported to the dean's office. Yeah. So you said we're not allowed to work with our fellow students. Are we allowed to come in and ask specific questions on code T? Yes, absolutely. Just making sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of what me and the TA are more here. Like, we can help answer those questions. And so, yeah. But you can always ask a you know, high-level question to the class mailing list, right? Um, be like, ah, I'm trying to compile it. I'm getting this compile error. Right? That's totally fine. And then somebody says, oh, it's probably because you're not using these flags or something, 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 right? Um, yeah, absolutely. OK. All right, another big thing, submitting a prior student's code as your own. So we have all the code that's been written for this course since I would say the dawn of time, I don't think that's correct, but I think it's like 2005, so it might as well be. Um, so yeah, if you submit a student's code from another year, right, which is just as bad, um, and that there can actually still be consequences for that student. So if you take somebody's code from last semester and submit it as your own, um, just like if you took from another student of this semester, right, that still can be an academic integrity violation. Yeah? What if it's on the GitHub? All right. <laughs> Do you have plants? Did I tell you just can't pass that question? No, I, I heard last year that everyone did that. Uh, that's how everyone got caught. Yeah, so um, that was part, that was one group. There were multiple <laughs> clusters, if you will. Okay, so let's talk about this. So, so why do you want to post your projects online? Portfolio shows what you've done. Yeah, perfect. I totally understand that. I totally get that. But think about it from the employer's perspective. Do they really want to see your classwork? Not really. How many people have done the CSE 340 programming assignments? At least 125. Well, per semester. Not to the end. At least, I don't know, about 200 from my last semester, let's say. And the semesters before that was probably another 250. It's probably like 1,000 people who have done these projects or similar versions of them since then. So honestly, from, a, from the employer's perspective, I can care less about what projects you do in class because that doesn't differentiate you from anybody else. What differentiates you is doing something different, something outside of class, right? That's what employers want to see. They want to see that you put in that extra time and develop just some cool, stupid, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy, but just something different that you didn't have to do for class because that makes you stand out. Um, and so this is why for this class, uh, do not post your projects online. I've had multiple, multiple issues in my various classes where uh, some students during the semester submitted it online right after the deadline, and then other students found that code and took it and submitted it as their <laughs> own uh, for the late penalty. Um, some people took uh, old students' code that they found online. Yeah. What about using it for the purposes of you know version control and you know that kind of stuff? If you, especially if you have like access to private repositories now. If you have access, if it's private, absolutely, totally fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can even, I mean, that's kind of the beauty of Git, right? You can use it just in a directory without a server, but if you want the backups there and do it privately, that's fine. Um, if you do, let's see. Can I, I think GitHub is available to pretty much everybody in this room through ASU. <coughs> Perfect, with so. private repos? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, you said the sign for the student package. Yeah, but sometimes it takes like a month. I got mine in like less than a couple hours. Uh, if you have any problems, I think also Bitbucket you can use. They have private repos. Um, I think we could probably give you access to our server if all else fails. So yeah, if you have any questions, if there's anything like that, just totally ask. But uh, please don't post your projects online. It's not honestly, it's not helpful to you, and it's not helpful to the future students who take this class. So you know, you worked really hard on these programming assignments. Let the next group work really hard on their programming <laughs> assignments, right? Questions on that? Yeah. File bucket gives free private ones, correct? It's unlimited. Bitbucket? Bitbucket. That's yes. Yeah, yeah. Bitbucket does. Like, oh, gosh, another thing I don't know. Yeah. I have a question.
question about the project. So sure. is it it's only in C and C++? Yes. Okay. I think we're good. Oh, maybe we won't get there. Does that include C++11? Mm, probably not. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> like, just got released. Um, the thing is we have to, I, we have to check uh, the submission and automated grading system is targeted to a specific OS and specific version, right? Which makes sense because there's uh, 125 of us here. And I think there's 140, 130 in the other section. We're all using the same submission system. So if, uh, you know, we have to all standardize, right? So if you're using some weird Microsoft C compiler extension feature that doesn't work in the GCC version that we use, like, it's just crazy. Like, nobody wants to deal with those problems. So that's why we, we standardize. I'll have to check with um, Professor Bazzi's TA, who's managing that system, to see what exactly um, version it's using. Because I would, I would like to, I, I want you to be able to use the latest cool stuff. Um, you know, but you have to trade that off with, we have a system that works. <laughs> right, this automated grading system works. It's pretty bulletproof. It ain't so exactly, what's going to happen when we upgrade and then things break? What you know, then we have other headaches. Yeah. Uh, is the entire project grade based on test cases? More or less. Okay. Yes. So, um, see, do I even have anything about that? No. Okay, we can talk about that in a second. Ah. Oh, class is so short. Okay. <laughs> I'm not used to these. Okay. Uh, update. I could update the syllabus. You know, things change. Yes. Is the syllabus only available at, at what appears to be your website? Yes. Okay. It's a link from the a my ASU thing. Would you be like willing to thing? put this link in the Blackboard for some? Because there's a syllabus heading, but I, there was nothing there. Uh, it should be a link to here. Okay. Or at least I changed that this morning. Okay. I don't know. I was setting okay. it up this morning, so okay. maybe there's see, more Blackboard weirdness. <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you want to go to the thing, uh, to the syllab to the course stuff, you go to my website, teaching, classes, your spring 2016, right? Okay. okay. 340, cool, and cool. everything will be posted on here. So lecture slides, the links to the recorded lectures. Uh, I didn't mention it, sometimes I'll record office hours if I think that it's useful, hmm. so I'll post those online. Because uh, I know oftentimes everybody can't make every office hours and people have work commitments. Um, and the links to the relevant book sections. Let's see, okay, yeah, I guess I don't have a, okay. Hmm. All right, let's talk about the programming project. All the projects will be done in C or C++. Uh, the first homework assignment is, uh, the first programming project is to get you set up with a Linux environment. So that way we know that you're running the exact same uh, Linux version distro that is, and compiler that is used on our assessment system. So that way we get rid of all these headaches. Uh, there are many, many, there's all, even though we did this before, there's many, many problems where people are like, oh, I'll just develop on Windows. Like, Professor doesn't know what he's talking about. I'll develop on Microsoft Visual Studio, uh, which is a fine environment, right? But then when you decide like a couple hours before to then try and port that over to our Linux environment, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, right? So if you're in a company and we're like, hey, we need a new feature for this product, you go code it, you push it out, and then it goes into production and it fails because you were using Ruby 1.8, but production uses Ruby 1.9, does it matter that you wrote all this code? No, because it's broken, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work in production, it doesn't work. So that's why we use the automated submission system because uh, it's, I, I believe it's more fair, right? So uh, some of the test cases we will give you, some of the test cases we will not. I think I'll talk about those more in upcoming classes. Uh, any other questions on course stuff? Yeah? Um, what ID would you suggest considering you just use Visual Studio as the reference as one that wouldn't be perfect for this class? Uh, any, well, it's not really the IDE, it's the periodic, <coughs> you need to test, I mean, honestly, uh, if you want to be, I think I'm going to cover this to Wednesday, uh, but I would use something like Emacs or Vim, anything that you, so if you, I'll talk about it on Wednesday, but that's what, I use Emacs, um, uh, you can use whatever, I mean, honestly, whatever. You can use Sublime Text. You could use Notepad, I guess, but that would be terrible. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> as long as you have a good write, compile, run test cases loop, right? And, you, and you're actually running the test cases on the same operating system that we're running our automated test cases on. Because it works on my machine, but not on the submission server is not a valid excuse, right? You might as well have not done the assignment, so. Um, yeah, you could, you could use Visual Studio.
studio, but if you wait to port, it's going to bite you. It's going to be a problem. Yeah. So, so with that, with that, with saying that, would you mm -hmm. recommend us putting some version of or a particular version of Linux? Yes, we will get we'll get into that uh, very soon once we yeah. once we make sure we're standardized. Yeah, that's what the first project is. It's basically install this version of Linux on a virtual machine, all that kind of stuff. There's tons of resources. Oh, the other problem, that's right. The other problem with the uh, Linux version is we want to use the same version that's available in the labs in case you lose your laptop or whatever and that's available in general. Uh, so if we deviate from that too much, then we have problems. So you use the same version as ASU General? Because ASU General has C++ pattern. It has a, mm. it has a <laughs> weird version. It's like a pre-11 thing. We had problems last semester, so that's why I don't know. Anyways, that's a bit funny. Okay, cool. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's talk for a little bit. Okay, so the class is called Principles of Programming Language. So what does that mean? Why programming languages work? Why programming languages work? Kind of a deep question. <laughs> We'll definitely go into how, how they work, right? Why they work. I guess that is also covered, yeah. Maybe the fundamental structures that underlie all programming languages. Yeah, so some kind of, uh, we want to talk about programming languages. We want to understand what's possible. So what is a programming language? How would you define it? What was it? Uh, stuff you can write so that the computer can do stuff, basically instructions for the computer. Instructions for the computer. Can my Intel processor run my Ruby code? Yeah. It's human readable text that can be taken into a computer and then converted to the way the computer speaks. Human readable text that can be taken into a computer and translated into something that a computer can read? So what if you, so, let's see. Is x86 assembly a programming language? Technically. Technically? Is it human readable? Technically? <laughs> <laughs> there are people who make this. What about the ones and the zeros, like the binary, you know, the, when it is compiled, like the binary, you know? Probably not. <laughs> it's not really human readable, but it's the compiler can execute it. Yeah. What else? Anybody? That's probably a better definition of higher level programming language. Yeah, higher level programming language. I like that. Is it? Have we covered it? Covered. <laughs> Syntax. It's a defined syntax. What do you mean by that? Um, it has specific code. It has specific lines of code that will um, do certain uh, do certain functions. I guess for right now we can maybe say that there's a way to tell what's a valid program in that programming language and what's not, right? In some way, that's you could say. Yeah. Pretty much just a set of tokens and values. A set of tokens and values. That's like high level, what is a programming language? Yeah. Grammatical and syntactical structures paired with variables to allow for a computer to run and develop software. Does a programming language have to have variables? No. Usually. Does it have to? <laughs> We're actually at the very end of the class, we'll look at a language that does not have any variables. So I've been actually, so I've actually refined this definition because the more I think about it, the more, I don't know, I, I change my mind. But this is what I kind of like to think of it. It's a structured way to define computation, right? So structured kind of gets to the syntax thing, right? There's ways to tell what is the, in this programming language. There's ways to tell what's not. Um, defining computation is like a recipe for a cheeseburger, <laughs> a programming language, or a program written in a programming language. Recipe for a cheeseburger, a program written in a programming language? Uh, I would say no, because let's define computation as actions carried out by a computer, and I don't think, well, we might be able to read a cheeseburger, little, but. Could be a little recursive definition, or self referential. <laughs> you 
Body yeah, computation yeah. as something that's done by a computer. All right, in that case, what's <laughs> computation? Yeah. I think it is. Yeah, why? Well, it's, it's definitely structured with the fine order and the ingredients have to be specific. The time specific is basically fine. And then the computer, the individual plus is like the next one. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think it's, it depends, right? So it depends on maybe the recipe, depends on what you consider computation, it depends on, what were the original computers? Where did the term computer come from? It was a person who did math. Yeah, a person who did math, right? When they were, especially when they were doing the uh, Manhattan Project, they just had rooms full of people doing math problems, <laughs> and they would like pass the results to the next person, right? And they called those people computers, because they were like computing results. So what's the purpose of a programming language? To accomplish a task. To accomplish a task, that's a pretty good, I like that as a high level definition. What else? Well, one thing is to make the programmer more productive. Yeah, it could be to make the programmer more productive. So, um, but that's not right. Is it the purpose of a programming language itself? Or is that more so the, what could you say? That's more so how we would compare two programming languages, maybe. But it could be the purpose of creating a new programming language, let's say. Right? Yeah. Uh, to facilitate uh, the ability for the programmer to interact with the computer. Yeah, so you want some way, I think that goes to the very beginning where we're talking about inter like talking to a hardware, right? Some, some piece of hardware. Are you only ever talking to computers when you write when you write programs? Depends yeah. on how broad your definition of computer is. <laughs> we'll go back to the original, or our normal definition of a hardware thing. Yeah, yeah it also programming languages so other people can read your code. Yeah, exactly, right? So oftentimes you're actually writing code not just for the computer, but you know that somebody else is gonna have to read this code and fix bugs in it. So you may be writing for your teammates, you may be writing for your future self two years from now. Have you gone and looked back at your freshman year code that you wrote? <laughs> Probably terrible, right? Yeah. Maybe I should do that. I won't do that now. But, um, yeah, it could be we want to uh, communicate an algorithm, right? So we may want to just, we may not even care if it runs. We're just trying to communicate some idea, some algorithm. Uh, we may want to use it to describe a process to communicate a whole system to another person, right? So now we're not even really talking about machines. Uh, and we may wanna communicate instructions to, your, to a machine. So how does the hardware understand your instructions? So the beauty of a compiler. The beauty of a compiler, I like that. I may steal that. <laughs> Is it magic? <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. Anybody who's not computer science, yes. Yes? Everybody who's not computer science. I guess that's true. Uh, the answer is no, right? It's not magic. There's no magical way that the hardware eventually executes your stuff. What does the, your CPU understand? Machine code. Zeros. Machine code, yeah. Or you can think about it slightly higher up as assembly language, right? So we should just stand in front of our computers with these big ones and zeros <laughs> keyboard and just keep typing away. So. What do we need? What do we need? Do we want to program in those zeros and ones? No. Oh, that'd be crazy, right? I mean, you could do it. You'd be a little crazy. but <laughs> So we need some kind of way to translate our intentions to the assembly language that the CPU understands, right? And that's where we get compilers, right? And that's part of what we're studying here is how this translation process works. We're really, we're trying to, compilers are trying to translate a programming language essentially into an executable binary, right? So they take in a program written in a language and they spit out something that you can just essentially double click if you think about it at a high level. Uh, what about an interpreter? How's that different from a compiler? Yeah? It just goes line by line through your code. It doesn't actually compile. It's just executable. Right, so it doesn't compile. It's actually performing the computation itself, right? The program is doing that, not any underlying hardware. Now that program itself is actually running is an executable that's probably running on the actual hardware, right? So you got to think all kinds of levels. What about a transpiler? Anybody heard that term? No. I'm guessing just by the name it merges multiple languages? Merges multiple languages? Yeah. 
translate from one language down to another. Yeah, so these are uh, things, I actually don't like this term, I, I would much rather prefer the term compiler because a compiler doesn't have to spit out binary, it can spit out C or Ruby or whatever, right? Uh, but transpiler is kind of the, the new term for that. So for instance, let's say you're writing a web application and you want to use the new JavaScript, is it ES6 or 7 or ES8 six. feature 6? You want to use the ES6 features, but not every browser supports that. So they actually have transpilers that will take your ES6 JavaScript and <coughs> compile it to, it must be ES5 then, uh, JavaScript. And so that you're programming in the higher level language, but it actually comes out as the regular language that'll work in any browser. So in this class, we're gonna answer this question. How do they work? How do compilers work? How do, essentially, how and why programming languages work, right? We want to understand why do they work? What's, I don't want to use this word because I don't want to scare anybody, but what's the theory behind them, right? What are they, why, why can, essentially, why can we have programming languages? What does it mean to be a language? Why aren't we talking English? Which, I guess I'm not talking, but why are we writing English to our computers, right? So, anyways, uh, I think we will stop here. Uh, yeah, we're going to do some examples of programming languages. And Wednesday is a very important class. I'm going to talk about uh, specifically.